he hears the shouts of violent men as they get closer and closer to his home. He looks over at his wife and he gives her a reassuring look and and locks the door even though he knows it will not keep the angry mob out. He looks at some of the new Christians that are in his house now that he's gotten to know and really enjoy being with in these last few weeks and they say a little prayer together. But they hear the noise getting closer and closer and closer and they know there's one destination. There's one place in mind this crowd is heading and it's his house. It's Jason's house. He thinks back three weeks earlier how this whole thing started. How did he get himself into such trouble when he was just a good Jewish man of the synagogue, you know? I mean, part of everyday life in Thessalonica. And, 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 and here they are now, like almost like criminals. He thinks back three weeks before when he got up to go into the synagogue that day and he realized they had a special teacher that day. The one formerly known as Saul, now called Paul, sharing about this this Messiah, this Jesus. And he heard the message. He heard the scriptures. He heard that Christ was the suffering servant in Isaiah. He heard Paul's amazing story about meeting the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And he believed. He believed. Changed him. Changed his family. Paul was not much to look at, to tell you the truth. He didn't think this would be what the guy looked like that was the leader of this major Christian movement called The Way. He was known to be kind of short, not much hair, bowed legs, large eyes, unibrow. (laughs) Maybe not the guy you think would be like, this is the guy. But oh, when he spoke, his preaching, his teaching, making the connections with Torah seeing that Yeshua was the one that was prophesied about all along and that he actually had to die, the Messiah had to die. He believed it all. It was powerful. He he, he felt the Lord call him. He felt a moving in his soul that this was true. And so he believed. And now, only three short weeks later, there's jealousy because you've got Greek-speaking, uh, God-fearing people that are giving their lives to Christ. You've got prominent, rich women of that society that are giving their lives to this Jesus. And everybody's jealous. The synagogue people are jealous of it, and so they've called violent men to get together and go to his house. They've hidden Paul. They've hidden Silas. They won't find them, but they're certainly going to find Jason. And they break into his house, They bring him out and take him to the city council. They make an accusation that he finds ironic. He says, this guy is supporting the people that have uh, turned the world upside down. He thinks, well, that's exactly what they're doing. Because this all started with a vision. This all started with Paul, Paul laying down one night and having a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, please come over here and tell us and help us. And Jason knows he was one of those people that needed to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he stood before the council, answering their questions, reassuring them these men are causing no trouble. These men are peacemakers, not troublemakers. Posted his own bond, went back to his home. Paul and Silas, meanwhile, headed to the next city, the next place that they were going to share the gospel. But what they had planted in Thessalonica would grow. It would flourish Even in the midst of persecution, it would not be stopped. Would you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 today? And it's with that background that we read this uh, very pastoral, very heartfelt letter to the Thessalonian church. Certainly Jason would be one uh, one of those unsung heroes of the faith that took in Paul and Silas and uh, certainly uh, paid the price for it, and yet uh, not the ultimate price. He was, his life was spared, but um, his reputation, his standing in the community, how people thought of him, all of that was impacted by his uh, almost like being a patron of Paul and Silas during their stay in Thessalonica. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. 
We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. So we're jumping into a new series uh, this new year. I'm not wasting any Sundays. We're jumping in on December 30th. I know this is normally Senior Pastor Skip Day, but I'm here this morning. So for all the times that I've been out and tried to see the, the, whatever pastor of the church I'm going to, I never got to see the main pastor. But if you're visiting Grace, you, you get the real deal, right? I mean, this is me. There you go. There you go. No Sundays off here. Those will come later. Um, so <laughs> I've only been here a month. You can't take off yet, you know. That's just not how it works. Um, so here's what I want to do. I want to spend four weeks looking at our vision statement. Uh, and, and if you go online, it's right there, really bold. We want to connect to God. We want to connect to God's people. We want to connect to God's ministry. We want to connect to God's world. World. That's what we're here for. So we're calling this church on the move, and I think you'll see why as we jump into Thessalonians. Uh, the Seth Thessalonian church was a church on the move. And as you can see right away in chapter 1, um, he says, uh, basically what he's saying, he kind of gives the normal greeting, grace and peace, in verse 1. This is like when you sign your emails, you know, sincerely or love or dear whoever. It's normal Pauline greeting, grace to you. But it has more meaning because we know grace comes from Christ. And Christ is the Prince of Peace. So he's wishing these people grace and peace, and it has huge meaning to them. And then he goes on, and he, and he kind of he kind of says, first of all, why he's writing. He's like, I, I give thanks to God for you, for all of you. And what he does next is um, he mentions three participles, and I want to call your attention to them. Uh, he says, mentioning, remembering, and knowing. So verse 2 is the mentioning. That's one participle. And, 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 and it, and it kind of comes after the thanks. Like, well, how am I giving thanks? Because um, I'm mentioning you in our prayers. And then in verse 4, he says, for we know, that's a participle, for we know. And then, um, so, so we're going to go through these, and what I want to do is just call your attention to what Paul's talking about here, and he's saying, you guys are a great church, and, and when I think of you, Thessalonian church, I remember, that's a participle, I remember your work of faith, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope. You've probably heard this at some point in your Christian walk, right? Faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. And so what Paul says, and what I think he's getting at here is, um, we, the church, are a people of virtue. Faith, hope, and love. We are a people of virtue. And that's what the Thessalonian church was known for. Their faith, their hope, their love. A pretty good thing to be known for. And, and every church is known for something, aren't they? Whether it's something they want to be known for or something they don't want to be known for, we're all known for something. One of the things I'm going to do in January is going on a listening tour, and I want to hear from you what you think Grace Church is known for. When people in the community hear about Grace Church, what do they think? What comes to your mind? That's an important question. Are we a people of virtue, faith, hope, love? Some churches, I think it's, 2018 has been an interesting year. Uh, it's been a difficult year for some churches and some pastors as uh, scandals have happened. A lot of them become really well-known um, in, in the Me Too generation, this movement that's happened, um, a lot of things have come out that have been formerly not disclosed. But we as a church, I, and, I, and I hope, I hope that when you hear about these churches, often they're very large churches, I hope that when you hear about a pastor that has fallen, that it makes you pray for them. I hope that you would never be the kind of person to say, well, you know, that's how it goes there, and, and, and you know, that, that's how it is in those unfaithful, no, no. I hope that it makes you pray because these churches now have a reputation that they want to get rid of, that they want to lose and say that we're here because of Christ and we, we don't want anything to do with, with works of darkness. We've got to deal with that stuff and, and it happens, but we don't want that to be the mark of our church. Yes, we're all sinners, right? We're, we're, we're all imperfect, 
but, but this is not something we're standing for. And so we ought to be praying for churches that have been marked by something that is going to take years to get through. What are we known for? Hopefully we're known as people of virtue. So I want to go a little further here. I want to look at these virtues in depth. And I want to say this about them first. Um, we are moving in faith, ho- love, and hope. Now, I'm not just saying that because we're called church. This is called church on the move. I'm not just saying it because of that. But I believe when you read 1 Thessalonians, you see movement when you see faith, love, and hope. So t- check this out the way he says it. He says, I remember your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. Now, when I think of virtues, I, I think of these internal qualities, right? Love is something on the inside of me. Hope is something that I experience personally. You know, virtues usually are things we think of as on the inside. And they are on the inside. I'm not saying they're not. But when Paul talks about this church, he says, I see these virtues on the outside of you. I see your work of faith and your labor of love. This is a, this is a get your hands dirty and get things done. It's a moving church. It's an active church. And this is what Paul calls out. They are moving in faith love, and hope. Let's talk about each one of these for a second. Um, I'll I'll pull up the Greek words for you because that'll help us in talking about them. When I read this, my first thought was, what is the difference between a work of faith and a labor of love? Paul, are you being redundant? You know, I I don't think he is because he uses two different words. It's a work of faith and a labor of love, and that's intentionally different. Uh, Check out the word work, um, er ergon. Um, An act, deed, or a thing done The idea of working is emphasized in opposition to that which is less than work. So so this can be any kind of work that you're doing. Anything that you do by faith, it's the encouraging word that you say to your coworker because they're having a bad day and you want to share something with them. It it can be just as simple as a word. It's the check that you write and drop into the offering as is your habit every Sunday. It's a work of faith. In fact, Paul says in Romans, anything that doesn't come from faith is sin. So everything we do, should come from our faith. Everything should be fueled by us knowing Christ and wanting to live for him. It can be big things. It can be little things. It can be anything. It's your work of faith. It's the things you've done in this last week. Hopefully it's even how you eat your lunch together. You eat by faith, giving glory to God. It's all of those things. It could also refer to, possibly refer to, remember when Jesus says that the work is to believe, you know, the work that you're supposed to do is to believe. So, We don't work for our salvation. In fact, um, believing is not a work, right? But it's it's something that we do. We believe, and that's how we receive salvation. And so um, it could even be the work of faith, meaning uh, just believe, believe in Christ. I happen to think it's broader. I think ergon is a very broad word. It can mean lots of different things that all come from your faith. It should be everything that you do today, coming from your faith. Now, What's interesting is, he says, it's a labor of love, a kapos of love. Toil, labor, laborious toil, involving weariness and fatigue. You get the difference there? There's a big difference. Work is just anything you do, and and labor is hard. Now, when we say labor of love, we usually mean something like this, you know. Went over to grandma's house and mowed her yard for her this week. It was a labor of love. You know, and what we mean is, grandma didn't get her checkbook out and write me a check. I just, I just did it because I love her, you know, and, and, and I'm not doing it for the reward. Just doing the work is the reward. You know, I did something nice for somebody. It was a labor of love. But that's not how, I, I, I'm guessing that the, the phrase labor of love probably comes from this passage. And yet, we've totally misunderstood it, if, if that's how we use it today. That's just the normal way in English. But the kapas of agape, right? Agape would be based on Christ's sacrificial love, giving himself completely for us, and then we're doing this hard labor, this toil. This is above and beyond. This is the extra mile. This is like, you know, this is like investing yourself in another family, and you know they're going to require a lot of your time and attention, and they need you. This is like saying, I'm going to help you work on this major project. Don't pay me. I'm going to help you, and it's taking a lot of hours. This is the person that goes to a, a foreign country and gets malaria as they're helping somebody, you know. Um, th- this, this is the people that go above and beyond, and it's costing them something. That is the labor of love. And so Paul says, you guys are a church that gets your hands dirty. You get in there and you do some things that are hard 
and you don't back down. And so what I would ask you, even as we come into 2019, the question is going to be, what is God calling us to do that's difficult? Man, usually in church we want to make things as easy as possible. And, and, and I like making things understandable. I'm one of those people. I want to make things understandable. But I also want to challenge us to do some hard things, some things above and beyond what we could accomplish, to do some things that are completely sacrificial. You know, Paul sometimes says, I think to the Corinthian church, in 2 Corinthians, he says, you gave beyond your ability. That, that, that would be the labor of love kicking into play there, Right? Beyond your ability, you wrote the big check and you know it would hurt, but you knew you had to give to this thing, and so you did. This is the labor of love. It will cost you something, and it's motivated by a love for people and a love for the Lord. Um, And then lastly, there's that uh, hupamone. I should have looked at my pronunciation for that, but that's the steadfastness, the endurance. I think what Paul is saying, you guys have this, this enduring hope I love Alistair Begg. I heard him say once, it's a, it's a holding on kind of hope. You know, it's a hold on hope, you know. And so uh, I think that's what he's going for there. And he's, he's saying, you guys have been through some hard things. And, 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 and you're hanging in there. You're not letting go. You're waiting for Christ to come back. You're, 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 maybe, maybe you've even been discouraged. Maybe you're working so hard. Maybe, maybe you're doing so much that it's been difficult for you but you have this enduring, this steadfast, this holding on kind of hope and you're going to get through it. Maybe the end of the day doesn't bring many smiles for you because it's been really, really hard right now. Maybe the diagnosis you didn't want to hear, maybe that relationship that hasn't been fixed, but you're holding on to hope. And you may not go to bed with a smile, but there is something in your heart that says, Christ, one day this will be fixed. One day you'll give me a different diagnosis, whether in this life or the next. And I trust you for all that. I'm gonna see you one day. It's a holding on kind of hope. And this is what Paul says the church is known for. It's tough, it's gritty, it's getting things done. Now, I'll also have you notice in that same verse, he says, it's a steadfastness of hope, this is verse three, in our Lord Jesus Christ. None of this is because they're just a wonderful, wonderful church, wonderful people. You know, yeah, they are wonderful, but this is in Christ. Christ did this. Christ gave them this faith, this hope, this love. He's working this. And then there's this awesome word that I love uh, in verse four. It's the word for, F-O-R. He's like, I just, for, I just want to explain this a little more to you. I just, I just want to fill this out a little bit. Your faith, your hope, your love, let me tell you where that came from. Uh, for, for we know, brothers, that's, that's the last participle, by the way, know. Um, you would technically translate it knowing. Knowing, brothers, loved by the Lord Jesus, uh, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came not only to you in word, but in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Here's what he says. He doesn't say beloved. That'd be like one word. He says brothers loved by God. That, that's more than one word, obviously. He, he goes out of his way to say, you guys, this church, it's loved by God, and I know that he's chose you. He chose you. Now, I, some of you would love me to get into a deep talk on predestination like right now. Here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. But I'm not going to. Not going to. Um, sorry. We could talk about that afterwards. But, but I do want to call your attention to this, and, and I think this is important to point out, that that we might be moving in faith and hope and love. We might be a church that's active, on the move, well-known in our community, good reputation, but it's God that moved first. It's not us. We don't make a name for us. We make a name for the Lord, who is the mighty God, the living and true God. We want him to look good by the way that we do church. So God moved first by love and by choice. Now, um, when I read this, I thought to myself, Does God love me because he chose me? Or did God choose me because he loves me? You ever think things like that? Or is that just me? Sorry, okay. Um, I I think things like that. Now, I'm not going to do a big predestination talk. I'm not doing that. But but just to refresh your memory, uh, with predestination and election and free will, uh, most people fall into one of two camps. What is the defining factor of your salvation, of your faith? Is it your free will choice or is it God's free will choice of you? 
You know, which one is the defining factor? Some of you say both. That's fine too. But a lot of us would fall into a camp that says the defining factor of my salvation is my choice of God. I chose him. Some of you would say, no, no, I did make a choice, but God's choice of me was the deciding factor. Now, again, I'm not digging in deep there, but I'm just going to say this. Uh, Did God love me so that he chose me, or did God choose me so that he loves me? It's kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg? Kids, go home and figure that out, okay? Chicken or the egg, which one came first? Um, And I think it's an important question to ask because if, if God loved me so that he chose me, then that might imply that there's something more lovable about me than about unsaved Frank down there. You know what I mean? Like there's something about, like, of course God loves me. Of course he saved me. Have you seen me, you know? I'm a good guy. I'm exactly the kind of person he would save. And we dare not go down that road. We dare not go down that road. Because I'm in need just like everybody's in need of salvation. But if we say that he, uh, he loves me because he first of all chose me, then that might make God sound like he's kind of impersonal and distant and he was kind of like, you know, uh, Niall, yeah, yeah, I, I'll love him, yeah. I chose him, yeah, you get all my love, Niall, there you go. Like he's impersonal and distant and not near us. And so I think the answer is, and the right answer is, it's a both. God loves us, yes. God chose us, yes. Both are totally in effect. I think I could back that up with scripture. I'll, I'll give you a couple to think about. Um, one would be uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 4, and 5. If you want to look at that real quick, you'll just uh, pop back in your uh, Bibles a few pages. Ephesians 1. Ah, we'll start in verse 3. Always a good place to start right there. Uh, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, um, I see a few different things here. I see that he chose us. In verse 4, he chose us before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. I also see, at the end of verse 4, in love he predestined us. So which one is it? Did he love us so that he chose us, or did he choose us so that he loves us? And it's like both. It's both. He, he, He looked at you, and he set his affection on you before you were even born, before you even got here. He knew you'd be here, and he's like, I love that one. And he looked at you, and he said, I'm also choosing that one. Now, you could say he chose you because one day he saw that you would chose him. Cho- choose, cho- uh, choose him. You might, you might say that. That's what an Arminian would say. I love Arminians. I have a high respect for them. I'm a little more Calvinistic in my thinking, but um, I have, a, I have a, um, a, a big respect for both sides of that debate. My point is, God moved first. To you. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God makes the first move. And he stepped towards you with love and affection and with choice. And, and Paul says, I know that he did that. I know, Thessalonians, that you really were chosen by God because he says it like this. If you look at your scripture again, um, Because, verse 5, our gospel came to you not only in word, but in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. So let's talk about that just for a second. Um, Paul's talking about gospel communication. Like, I know that you're truly saved. This is the real deal. Because when we proclaim the gospel to Jason and the other believers in Thessalonica, he says, we spoke it. There was a word spoken. But there was also power, Holy Spirit, and full conviction of what was said. Now, um, there's a big debate between scholars. Think about this one. You can go home and talk about this one. Uh, Is this talking about Paul's conviction? Paul's power? The Holy Spirit working through Paul? Or is it talking about the Thessalonians receiving the word in power in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction? I'm reading all sorts of people this week to see what everybody thinks, and I think they're all wrong. Um, I, 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 I think it's both. I I really, truly think it's both. 
I, when you send an email, there's an act of communication going on. And when you click send, like you've composed this thing, hopefully you reread it, you read it once or twice. How many of you write emails and don't even look at what you just wrote, you just click send? Anybody? Yeah, there, there's one. I, there's always one, right? You got some misspelling, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. That's the way it works. Uh, you people that send text messages before checking your spelling, I can't do that. I'm like a grammar person. And I hate it. It just drives me nuts. Not when you do it. When I do it, when I see misspelling, I'm like, oh, that's the worst thing ever right there. Sorry. Um, but when you communicate something, there's, there's the person thinking about how they're saying it. You're typing it out, and then you click send. Now, if that email is never opened and never, ever read, communication's not happened, has it? It's got to be thought of, spoken, or written, and sent, and then received, read, heard. Communication's this two, two-party kind of thing. And I think that's what Paul's talking about here. He's like, the gospel came to you not only in words that you heard, it came in power, it came in the Holy Spirit, and it came in full conviction. So Paul is saying, when I shared the gospel with you, I myself, the Apostle Paul, was fully convicted that it was true. And when you heard it, you were fully convicted that it was true too. I think that's a beautiful picture of sharing the gospel. And so can I ask you, when you come to church, you come into church, you're going to hear the gospel, you're going to hear the word of God preached or read, you're going to be responding that something that God has said. Can, can I just ask you, is, is this the way that you receive the word? Is that how you do it? Like, w w when you respond to the word of God, is there power working in your life because the word's powerful? Is, is the Holy Spirit working on your heart when you listen? Do you have deep conviction that this is true as you receive it? That would be one of the marks that you're truly saved. It's how you respond to the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a mark of a believer. And that's how Paul's asking us to respond to the word. Maybe you want to talk to God about that and ask him if you want to change the way you respond to be more like this. So, um, here we are at the end. Um, and, and I'm going to keep this very simple. Very simple. Uh, the, the theme for this week is connecting to God. And I think you see that God is connected with us. He loved you. He chose you. And I think you see that we respond by moving in faith, moving in love, and moving in hope. That's our part as a church. How do you connect to God? And you can find this on our, the Grace website. This is something we put out there for everybody to see. We want to encourage people to gather together here as the body of Christ. Make weekly worship a priority. Now, I read statistics I read polls of, of Christians and churches, and I know, I know most people say if they're in church once or twice a month, that is full time. How about we blow that statistic out of the water, you know? How, how about that? You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, have you seen the one minute Bible, you know? I don't do that. And I don't really encourage people to do the one minute Bible. I mean, I, I know, maybe, maybe you do it and you love it and now you're mad at me for saying it, but, but you know, I mean, c can you do 15? Because I'm sure that after the one-minute Bible, you were on Facebook for half an hour, you know? Right? Like, let's just set our sights really low here, you know, and then, then we'll get everybody in on it, you know? Um, maybe you start with one minute and you bump it up to five next week. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. But would you make weekly worship your priority? Because it's in this place that we pray together, we worship together, we hear the word together, and God is shaping us to be the church that he's called us to be together. Would you blow the statistics out of the water and be a weekly worshiping congregation? That's what I'm asking of you. That's what we're going to keep asking of everybody. You know, I, I remember reading this story a long time ago. It was in the days where you wrote, you know, letters to newspapers and, you know, people could respond. And it was some magazine. I, I don't know what it was. But someone wrote in and said, I'm done going to church. I go to church, you know, 52 weeks out of the year. I hear the pastor, so I, I've, I've heard hundreds of messages over the years. I can barely remember one of them, you know? I mean, they just don't stand out to me. I've heard all this stuff, and I think it's just a colossal waste of time. 
signed, uh, bored and busy. That's how he signed, you know, his name. And then uh, the editor wrote back to the person and said, you know what? I've decided to stop eating. I, I can't remember most of the meals I've had, and I've, eat, I've eaten thousands of meals in the course of my lifetime. Most of them do not stand out to me. I've given it up. Signed, starved, and stupid. <laughs> so, um, would, you, would you have a thirst for the word, a thirst for getting together, and worshiping with us on a weekly basis. Let's blow the statistics out of the water. Not trying to guilt anybody. I'm just trying to say, you know, we all need a week off. I'm not legalistic, you know. I'm not going to knock on your door and like, where were you on Sunday? I don't believe in that whole deal. Not legalistic. But just a a desire to be together as God's people. That's what I want to encourage as the church. I'll even let you do three out of four Sundays of the year, out of the month. How about that? I'm just kidding. Uh, you, You go as God moves in your heart. That's what I want to see. Now, um, finally, we've talked today a lot about what Christ has done for us. Uh, can I just tell you, if you need to receive Christ today, you know, maybe you didn't take communion, can I just say, maybe today is the day that the Lord, you realize the Lord's choosing you, that he loves you. Maybe today's the day he's drawing you in to know him. Can I pray a prayer? And if this is in your heart, would you pray this? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes now? If the Lord's moving in you right now and you know that you're the one that he loves and you've never taken a step towards him, would you pray something like this in your heart? Lord Jesus, today I recognize that I am a sinner. I've done so many things wrong that have offended you and have not obeyed your laws. But I believe that Jesus died on the cross for me, paid for my sins, not deserving of it. I I confess it. I turn from it. I don't want to live that way anymore. So please forgive me. Help me start over with a new life. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. And if you prayed that with me today, with everyone's heads down and eyes closed, if this was your day, would you look up at me? If this, if this was a day you responded, was there anybody today that prayed with me? That's my question. Would you look up at me at this time? Looking around. All right. I see you, young lady. Could I ask you to get involved in a church? I don't know if you're involved in this church or not, but, but jump into a church. Get plugged in. Uh, get to know Christ better. If you need a Bible, take one from the seat. Just take it with you. It's not stealing. We gave it away. Um, take a Bible with you. Get to know your Savior. Um, I I suggest starting maybe in the Gospel of John. Read about him, love him. This is a new year. This is a new thing. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for this young woman that has responded today. I pray that you, uh, that she would completely know your great love for her. Pray you transform her life on the basis of her faith that she's expressed today. Lord, may she get plugged into a great church that loves you, wants to follow you, Maybe this one. And Father, would you be with all of us now as we head into this new year that by by these virtues, we would be known. The Grace Church would be known in this community as a people who work hard in the faith, who labor vigorously in love and have a holding on kind of hope even when life gets really, really hard. Thank you for your great salvation. Thank you for your awesome grace. Thank you that we know we're walking into the new year with you and that you'll never leave us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.